excited to be here for this live in-person recording episode of the Hired Geek Podcast at the Times Higher Education Digital University's U.S. event. Recording with a few folks while I'm here in this conversation, I think we'll have a unique perspective, certainly the kind of wider world of higher education, the associations and things that help institutions do their best work. So, and we'll be focusing in on digital transformation, certainly is a big topic here at this event exploring it a little bit with our guests. So Karen, if you want to introduce yourself, I'll give a brief professional background and then we'll get into our conversation. Sure, Dustin. It's great to be here. I'm really enjoying the conference and the opportunity to network with colleagues and learn new things. I'm Karen Vignari. I have been at APLU now for five years. I'm the vice president of digital transformation for student success. Our work started under the Personalized Learning Consortium, which is still is part of a department that reports to me, and that work um, continues. Um, Our work at APLU, the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities, um, obviously has been around a long time since the land grants were started back in the 18, um, uh, basically the 1800s. So uh, we are pleased to uh, constantly be evolving and recognize our role in contributing to this country's access to higher education. And it is a great opportunity to think about how we're going to continue to evolve as institutions working in these fields where our student populations need access to digital um, online learning, digital tools, student success, student services, et cetera. So our work at APLU is very focused on federal advocacy, which is not my work, right? My work is definitely very limited around the digital transformation work, and it's a great, great uh, sector to be in right now as, as evidence of being here at this event. But it's a great opportunity to also think think about the contributions that APLU makes in terms of the country representing the institutions. We have about 260 institutions. Some of those are land grants, but generally they're also ranked research grants, uh, usually the highest ranked in a particular state, but we also have state systems that are part of it. And in the 1890s, our country also invested in historically black colleges and universities. So those are also members of APLU. Our students represent almost 50% of the baccalaureate, that is the entering uh, four-year degree students in this country. So it is important to think about how we're going to change to continue to meet those needs of those particular students and an evolving and changing workforce needs as we move forward. Yeah, I mean, that's really great. I think the, you know, the, just the scale, the scope sort of, you know, there's a lot of sort of complexity of obviously this moment for higher education and all the different institutions that you're working with, you know, the regions that they're in and the needs of those students and all that kind of stuff, uh, kind of all blending together. And I think you, I guess to clarify, like you're saying, like there's that arm of federal uh, advocacy, but you kind of focusing on like working with those institutional leaders to try to help sort of build their knowledge base or sort of you know, knowledge share with each other. And, the, you know, sort of the topic of the day here, like digital transformation among you know, many things, I'm sure. But your work is more focused on. These yeah. I, I, and I just clarify that just a little bit. My own personal work, uh, I started off as faculty in 1993, taught my first online class in 1997, and have been working in the online learning space pretty much since 1997. Recognize, it's always a fun story to look back at those people who didn't believe the internet was going to be as big as it did, but had professors basically say to me that, oh, this is not going to be important. And I said, you don't understand the communication value and the changes the world is going, which brings us a little bit to AI, right? And thinking about the opportunities that are going to be presented to higher ed through AI as well. But my work and my department and my teammates' work is all focused on 
Our institutions are doing phenomenal work at trying to improve teaching and learning in particularly our gateway, what we would call our primary, what what are also often called your foundational courses, which is where most students end up failing out. And there's a lot of ingredients scientifically. Learning science has given us great contributions. Technology gives us great contributions. But we also know our faculty are so important to our students' success. So it's never just about the technology, but it is about what what we would probably say a collaborative change management model where we're leading with the technology in order to support that change, not the other way around, right? The technology is not the change uh, because right now, I mean, we continue to know how important faculty are to inspiring, to having a relationship, to having empathy with students. And we don't want that to go away. And we don't want technology to take that away either. Yeah, really, really good points. And I think just my silly brain kind of thinking back to like, oh, man, you were teaching during like Y2K. And so like, you know, just all those little anecdotes of like one sort of history repeating itself, too, of like, you know, at that moment back in the day where people like, oh, you know, I don't know what to make of this sort of, you know, newfangled thing. And it's just like AI. And it's almost like even worse, I feel like, because it's just like, I guess higher ed loves its sort of like existential crises, but just like, how do we just sort of interface with these new changes and those sort of things? And you know, there's always going to be kind of the naysayers or the uh, early adopters and those sort of things. But uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll get to all that. And I think we'll, we'll start with sort of the bigger question. You know, I think you've kind of been sort of uh, hitting on a lot of the different things. And certainly this uh, event is talking a lot about just sort of broadly digital transformation. There's a lot of things there. And I think it is refreshing how many people have been kind of repeating the notion of like, it's sort of the like the means towards the goal, like the technology is the tool that can get you towards the solution that you're looking for versus the technology itself being the solution. So how do you see, I guess, the context and, you know, the scope of your work, you know, across the entire country, like what is emblematic of this moment right now for higher education with sort of digital transformation and all its shapes and forms sort of washing over uh, institutions all over the country? Like what's sort of just like really sticking out to you? Well, post-pandemic, I think um, what the world has learned is that it is absolutely possible to attend classes online, particularly at the college level, right? And when you think about the makeup of our students, and I'm probably not going to get these numbers exactly right, but probably over 60% of our students are over 25 And those students are generally working full-time. Even many of our students under 25 are working full-time. And many of them on top of that have primary obligations of parenting or helping other people do other things. And that requires flexibility in your schedule. So even if you wanted to continue education, oftentimes we didn't have the the methods we didn't have the opportunities for you to take certain classes online and what we're seeing is while online degrees are growing and that's a good thing uh, um, we're actually seeing the online courses as maintaining a significant uh, increase in the number of offerings. And we think that's going to continue. And what we're seeing is while our institutions are important places for lots of reasons, we don't necessarily need the classroom as it was in 2019 right? Uh, There is a place for important things that could happen in the classroom, right? Let's think about labs. Let's think about music. Let's think about art. Now, that's also not to say we couldn't have technology that supports any of them, but there are reasons to have um, hybrid classes, right? There are reasons to have blended classes as well. But by and large, we have to start thinking about the flexibility and convenience needed for students. And I would argue for faculty. Honestly, I think many of our faculty are adjuncts. They have other jobs, right? Uh, And many of our faculty also manage the same things. They are managing 
potentially research work. They are managing, oftentimes they have other professional obligations and they have primary obligations of taking care of people as well. So I think our faculty also found that it was an opportunity to teach these online classes. So I think that is going to continue to be a huge driver. What we haven't figured out, I think is really true, and I think AI is going to help us a little bit. We haven't figured out really, we haven't figured out well in online programs how to do the social networking that happens in learning, right? And Having Zoom is not the same as social networking. So Dustin and I have had a a minor chance to interact, right? But we're also able to talk in a different way than the conversation he and I had over Zoom. And those nuances, I hope we get better at online, but right now we need some of those things happening on our campuses. And I would argue that our campuses are not only great places for social learning, they're also an opportunity for many of our students who are coming from poverty affected to have an equal digital opportunity. And what we mean by that is they have access to devices that work. They have access to the internet that is consistent and constant. And while many of us try during remote learning to either offer our students, you know, uh, opportunities to get Wi-Fi or to have devices, that couldn't be consistently done, where on a campus it can be consistently done. And we also have an opportunity not only to bring them together, but to give them services that we haven't quite figured out how to do well online that require a lot of empathy. We all know that students' mental health is incredibly important right now. And while I would say you should get online appointments, you may also need to do that in person at times. So there's a lot of opportunity happening here. But the digital transformation side, I think, is is one of the things and tend to like to be simplistic. It's very complicated, right? But when I'm simplistic, what I really think is we need better data to improve learning. And by having more things digital, we are going to be able to feed this thing called AI, machine learning, generative AI, to get to those students we're losing. We need to recognize as an industry, and maybe not all of the APLU institutions uh, are performing as well as they want, but by and large, nationally, we perform better, but many of our institutions have lost up to 70% of the students that enter into. That is not something to be proud of. We have to figure out, and in many cases, those have been persons, uh, students of color, uh, and we need to get better because there's no reason uh, um, that we can't do better. And I think now is the time to really think about that. So when I think about the opportunity around digital transformation, it's really to gain more insight so that we can respond much faster. And higher ed, we're very good at what we like to call post-mortem analysis, right? I want to be able to have real-time opportunities for faculty who know what the content they're teaching, who know how to give students motivation to be able to reach out to students when they need that help and that's what digitalization brings to us on the academic side in higher education it's almost impossible to truly stand out ology gets it as a branding and marketing agency that focuses on education they understand that what makes you authentic is also what makes you distinct Ology offers award-winning creative, smart strategy, innovative thinking, and expert digital marketing. Most of all, they'll help you connect with your audiences, bring your stakeholders together, and achieve the results that matter most to you. Want to find out more about how you can build a compelling brand or campaign? Visit ology.com. That's O-L-O-G-I-E dot com and mention that Dustin from Higher Ed Geek sent you their way. Yeah, I mean, a lot of great points. I mean, just around efficiency and, yeah, like the the speed, you know, like there's a lot there that's sort of resonating with me around uh, 
I think you said sort of like th- rethinking physical spaces where you can maybe kind of pump the brakes and be like, okay, I guess maybe we don't need to like just keep like building sort of a arsenal of buildings and classroom spaces and offices with, you know, just more online courses and online programs. Like you can just sort of get more flexible with space and how you're using spaces. But then like you said, like that, that desire for flexibility being, you know, there for students as much as faculty and that being really important. But it's just an interesting moment because I think there's, like you said, there's always going to be that hybrid sort of reality that I think we're just, you know, continually marching towards that frontier where it can be, okay, how do we have a very sort of nimble, accessible, it's like, you know, telehealth or sort of virtual tutoring, virtual counseling, different things like that, but also just maybe leverage tools that make it easier for students to book in-person appointments with a counselor, with an advisor, with a coach or anything like that versus it having to be a, you just sort of waltz into the office, hopefully they're available and you're just waiting or it's like a 20 email chain to try to be like, are you available? I don't know, you know, um, and those sort of things like you can just on so many different fronts. And that's what I think I like, especially about this uh, event so far. Like in, as we're recording this, it's almost over. So like there's been a lot of the sessions happening, a lot of conversations. It's like there's so much kind of a dynamic nature to what is digital transformation like what is sort of the the hybrid experience for students and everything so I, I think there's like you said just so much potential and so much opportunity and like you know almost just like let's use our imagination here you know like let's sort of get inspired sort of you know be optimistic about the opportunities here because I think everybody went through such ambiguous disruptive tough years and sort of coming out of it you know, it uncovered a lot of different things around, you're talking about the digital equity gaps and, you know, this, these, these problems that we have to confront and almost take that as like, take it as an opportunity, you know, like we kind of see the clear and present dangers and we have so many great tools out there that are getting better all the time. Like you said, like the more people use things like AI, the better it gets. So not to say, obviously, it's just going to be like, oh, we're going to replace everything with AI, but it's just like, it's going to be that sort of sl- slow, sort of continuous improvement of as we find more and more opportunities to kind of insert it to achieve those goals of greater quality, greater accessibility, greater sort of responsiveness, it's only just going to get better. So I think it is just sort of a good kind of call out. And we can sort of sit with this for a little bit because I, just, I just wanted to sort of have this as a specific question. I don't know if you've gone to any sessions on it or what, you know, but like sort of your observations of those opportunities for leveraging AI specifically, if you've seen some good examples or there's things that you're sort of keeping your eye on. So I'm going to start with a, a little bit of my learnings from this, what, what I, I'm seeing that is incredibly motivating is that there is a lot of discussion around how faculty will integrate this into the classroom and how those skills will be translated into their opportunity, the, the student's opportunity to create new business uh, skills and things. And I think that is an obvious area where we see faculty leadership, faculty innovation, and then we see the result that could improve students' marketability, students' being able to work in businesses that are ever increasing their use of AI. What I am feeling concerned about in listening to my colleagues in the session is I don't think we we still have a sense at the leadership level how we use this to internally get better as well right? Like there's this huge opportunity and everybody's really, really excited about how we're going to use this, you know, with students or not use it. I mean, occasionally you will hear institutions saying, let's stop it. And uh, that is not the answer. (laughs) Uh, But what I am a little bit concerned about is that institutions are kind of pushing this back to both researchers and to faculty only, where there are so many parts of the institution where data is not being analyzed because it's not very easy to get to, right? And that we're not thinking about the chores and the number of forms we fill out and the number of uh, of sort of mediocre kinds of jobs we have to do and how we get AI to help us do some of that to become more efficient so we can spend much more quality time in our humanness, right? Our humanness is around empathy and motivation and social learning and opportunities there rather than having, let's say, a department chair always going through the same set of forms for faculty review, right? Like, 
a lot of that data is being collected anyways, right? And so how do we bring out so that 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 in that case, a department chair is having a better conversation with a faculty member rather than just writing up a report and checking boxes, right? So, so I'm a little concerned that at sort of the leadership organizational level, we are not spending enough time thinking about what we could do better to become more efficient institutions. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it's something that's rung in my head for a long time. Uh, and it, it was from a recent podcast interview, I think, but like, any, you know, hour and minute of your time, any dollar from your budget that's spent on sort of those like inefficient processes or different things like that, it's like, isn't going towards students. Like that that time that you could be spending and even like you're saying, like even just with the, you know, faculty and staff working with each other of just sort of the business of keeping the institution operational as much as, you know, students and sort of the business of being a student, you know, the things they have to do. Just, I think like the biggest thing is, yeah, like you said it, just an outright no, never, not at all, not here. Like, it's not the answer. It's really like, again, that opportunity for a lot of creativity or sort of imagination as to like, how could we use this? Like, it's, there's not going to be any one only way for AI or it's like all AI all the time or not at all or something. So it's like, you know, it's that same thing where like, I think it's very refreshing to hear all the sort of different facets and nuances and kind of nooks and crannies of sort of digital transformation and how to leverage AI that, uh, at the end of the day, you know, it itself, that tool can achieve better student engagement and success and also just like through efficiency gains can like free up people's times to have more meaningful conversations with each other, with their students. And so I think there's, yeah, like a, what I would say I think is a, is a fairly wide open vista and it's it just up to us to sort of like start charting the path and just continue to use spaces like this to knowledge share and use sort of the network approach where people can kind of do their show and tell and say like this is how on sort of administrative level like we were able to integrate this and hopefully you know have that sort of continuing waves of sort of inspiration to help people continue to figure these things out so as we're winding down though you know we have our kind of two pretty standard final questions and certainly with our conversation today i'm sure there's any number of resources that you could have been or anything just from aplu that you want to direct folks towards to keep the learning going Sure. We've been privileged in the past to um, receive several either direct or indirect grants from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And in that work, much of those resources that we have contributed to, but other network partners have also contributed to Every Learner Everywhere. And I would suggest that folks go ahead and look at that website where you can find things we've done back almost Five years ago now, we did our first series on um, implementing adaptive learning. And it wasn't about the process and which tool is correct. It was about how to put a team together to do this in a way that is collaborative and recognizes everybody's role in doing this and continuous improvement and how important that is. And more recently, we've done a couple of pieces on implementing a digital learning infrastructure that is intended to increase equitable outcomes. And that was a a collaboration with Titan, but it also features a few APLU schools, one HBCU and several community colleges. So looking at this in a very broad fashion becomes really important. There's not necessarily one way of doing things, but There is an opportunity, and I think this is where APLU is incredibly well poised to continue its work around networking, right? Like, there may not be one model, but there may be an opportunity here to learn from each other on which is the model of implementation that's important for you. And I would say that's really important because I think the innovation and creativity at universities and colleges is just absolutely mind-boggling. What I don't see, unfortunately, is that many of us get to scale with that innovation. And it's hard. I mean, you know, if you think about the country, you think about our economy, you think about all kinds of things, we're much better at creating things than we are getting them to scale. 
right? So I'm not saying we're far behind, but I am saying we need to focus on that. And AI could be the set of tools that really give us that focus. So we're also working with George Siemens and Grail on what does AI mean for higher education leadership, right? And I can't say, again, I have the answers, right? But I can say it's important to do this in a collaborative way and to recognize the institution itself could benefit from AI, not just our faculty and our students and our researchers. Yeah, I mean, and especially spaces like this, it's like, I think if we just keep on talking to each other, we're going to figure it out, you know, or figure out, again, like those models, like you said, where it could be like, you know, all right, well, you could go X, Y, or Z, and this is why, and this is sort of the outcomes we had or the way that we did things. Even just that idea is that, like, certainly my background is like a content creator. It's just like, you know, nothing's original anymore. So it's just like you might see those three models and you just start, like, mashing stuff up. So it's, uh, you know, it's not entirely original. It's original in the sense that it's like this plus that equals something kind of, you know, different. But, um, yeah, I think I sort of rising tide lifting all ships. It's kind of like, hey, we're all on the same team. We're all working towards trying to better society through education. And even just like, because uh, honestly, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm an internal optimist, but like, you know, that institutions kind of get a bad rat, you know, like, you know, they're sort of looked at as sort of these sluggish, uh, you know, kind of venerable institutions, but it's like, they are incubators of so much creativity and all that. But I think, again, it is what exactly what you're saying of like, how do we make sure that this thing that works well does and can sort of grow up and reach its full potential and sort of have kind of that broader uh, applicability. So we will wrap up though. I mean, you've shared so many great insights already, but we always just like to give our guests the opportunity to wrap everything up with a fine bow here. Final thought, call to action on this topic to end the episode. So I guess my call to action is, I think Dustin has already said something like this, and that's we need to talk more and we need to act and create, I don't know if it has to be a strategic plan for using AI, but it has to be something at a higher level that brings in all part of your institutions. Simply asking one faculty member or even all the faculty in the freshman writing course to come up with what is it you're going to do is not uh, enough. We have to think about this as an opportunity to really change our institutions for the better. And we owe it to ourselves and to our students. As I said before, in some cases, we have community colleges and we have a few outlying private and even sometimes for-profit that only 30% of our students actually get their degrees. That is not acceptable today. We can do better and we should do better. And I think we can use this as an opportunity to get better. Yeah, absolutely agree. And uh, yeah, just uh, thankful for your time and everything that you shared. And we'll have ways uh, to connect with the resources that you mentioned and you as well, folks, to keep the conversation going. Great to chat with you. Thank you. Hey, y'all, Zach here from Enrollify. If you like this podcast, chances are you'll like other Enrollify shows too. Our podcast network is growing by the month, and we've got a plethora of marketing, admissions, and higher ed technology shows that are jam-packed with stories, ideas, and frameworks that are all designed to empower you to become a better higher ed professional. Our shows feature a selection of the industry's best as your hosts. Learn from Mickey Baines, Jeremy Tears, Jamie Hunt, Corinne Myers, Jamie Gleason, and many, many more. You can learn more about the Enrollify podcast network at podcasts.enrollify.org. Our shows help higher ed marketers and admissions professionals find their next big idea. Find yours at podcasts.enrollify.org.